It's estimated that one in ten children will experience sexual abuse before they turn 16. That's equivalent to three in every classroom. Most children won't tell anyone at the time. But there are signs to look out for. Has your child become more withdrawn or started acting differently? They could be trying to tell you something's wrong. To learn more about the signs and find further support, visit stopabusetogether.campaign.gov.uk. You're a visionary, an entrepreneur, a passionate business owner, driven by results and poised for growth. You need Opportuni. They easily match businesses of all sizes to winnable council, NHS and national government contracts. Just sign up, match with tenders and they'll help with the rest. Now is the time. Seize your Opportuni. Get your free trial at Opportuni.com. Opportuni. When your tenants have a burst pipe, superheroes crashing through the wall isn't going to help anyone. With Direct Line Landlord Emergency added to your policy, we're on it to send a rather super plumber in four hours and guarantee they'll use the doorbell. We can also assemble locksmiths, glaziers, electricians and drainage engineers. Search Direct Line Landlord Emergency. We're on it. Direct line. Residential properties. Optional add-on up to 1,500 per call-out. Extreme weather conditions may extend response time. Underwritten by UK Insurance Limited. Life is about sharing those magical moments. And food shouldn't be any different. For over 35 years, Marouche has been perfecting this experience with their delicious food, warm hospitality and live entertainment. Authentic Lebanese cuisine made the traditional way. Marouche, your family restaurant. Book now at marouche.com. Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC. With the British Airways American Express Accelerating Business Card. Turn everyday purchases into travel. Nine minutes, four eight is the time. Let's pick up on that story you've heard on the LBC News Bulletin. A licence to clean up the web is the headline on one front page, the Daily Mail. Porn sites forced to stop children accessing harmful content. A new raft of regulations to be brought in. And to explain them now, Conservative MP and Technology and Digital Economy Minister Chris Philp joins me. Minister, how will these work and when does it come about? Good morning. Good morning, Nick. So we're preparing some updates to the online safety bill. It was published in draft form last year. We're going to be introducing it to Parliament in the coming weeks uh, with a number of changes. One of the changes we're making that's being announced today is that we're going to have a duty on all online companies, both social media companies and commercial pornography sites, so everything, to make sure that no one, no child under the age of 18 is able to look at online pornography. We think that's really important because we're frankly horrified by the number of children who are looking at online porn. It turns out that over half, 51% of children aged 11 to 13 uh, have looked at online porn. Over half of those uh, stumbled across it by accident. We think that is a horrifyingly high figure. And the police have raised some concerns that the ready access to online porn uh, for children is fueling uh, this problem of sexual assaults and sexual harassment in schools and so we think it's essential to take kind of proper action to make sure this just can't happen any longer and that's the purpose behind these particular changes to the bill there'll be some other changes as well but these are the ones we're talking about today so in in brief detail how do the protection measures work what will someone of a relevant age need to do to access this material yeah so it'll the, the provision will place a duty on the uh, site carrying the pornography, whether that's a social media site with user-generated content or a commercial pornography site, it'll place a duty on them to make sure that people under the age of 18 uh, can't see the content. It's up to them to decide sort of practically and technically how they do that. There's a number of ways, a um, number of technical ways you can do that. There are some third-party organisations that do age verification. You can take a credit card swipe. There's a whole range of, I mean, gambling companies do this already. There's a whole range of, of methods you can use. Um, but it will, but it has to have the end effect that people under the age of 18 can't see this material. And Ofcom, as the regulator, will police this and make sure that whatever particular method any given company adopts actually works. And if they either don't do it or don't do it effectively, then Ofcom will have like, very wide-ranging enforcement powers um, to come down like a ton of bricks on anyone that doesn't discharge the duties that I'm describing. And, and just lastly, I can hear parents and possibly grandparents saying, when? When do we think this will be in place, Minister? Yeah, well, it's important to say this has, as you suggest, this has overwhelming public support. I think over 80% 
yeah. of the public think that this is the right thing to do. Uh, in terms of timing, we're going to be introducing the updated bill to Parliament so it can commence its passage in the coming weeks. We're hoping it will, hoping and expecting it will go through all of its parliamentary stages in the course of this uh, calendar year, 2022. And then we'll get it implemented as quickly as possible. Thereafter, Ofcom will draft some codes of practice and so on. So we're working uh, on this at pace. And as I say, it'll be introduced into Parliament in the coming weeks. And it'll be updated with this measure um, and a number of other measures to improve the bill compared to the draft we published uh, back in May of last year. And I appreciate, and you you're, you're, I appreciate you're not the architect of, of the machinery it has to go through, but some people mm. might say that. I mean, I think, say, candidly, you've been very fair. We're probably looking at another 12 months. Some people say, why can't we move a bit quicker? Because this is a clear and present danger, Minister. Yeah, well, well it is a clear and present danger. Um, but obviously, you've got to go through the part. If you're passing primary legislation, you're changing the law. You've got to okay. go through Parliament. You've got to go through the Commons and the Lords. If you're changing the law of the land, it's right it gets properly debated. You've got to go through the parliamentary process. That's how a parliamentary okay. democracy um, works. And then you've got to go through the implementation period afterwards. But we're like I say, introducing it in the coming weeks. And people like, uh, I think, Bernardo's and the NSPCC, children's charities have been calling for this change. We've listened to them. We've listened to MPs. Um, we've listened to the public as well. And that's why we're responding by making this change. And just lastly on this, I've taken a call from Kerry in Shetland, who's phoned in yeah. to ask, how can you possibly regulate overseas websites? Will this apply to those? Well, it'll, it'll apply to any uh, content being accessed from the UK. And of course, if, if a website is accessible uh, in the UK and people are using it, then it has to comply. Right. If UK citizens in the UK are using it, these regulations so the will apply. So the blocks will occur as it comes into the UK, effectively. Yeah, so ultimately, if an overseas website doesn't comply with Ofcom's uh, regulation, there are ultimately there are denial of service powers meaning to put it crudely you can just like cut cut off access you can switch to the website. off an overseas supplier effectively yeah in extremes that would be like the last step okay right you wouldn't do that you wouldn't no, do no. that straight okay. away but uh, but ultimately that sanction is available yes okay a couple of other things you're obviously you're part of the culture media digital and sport uh, department uh, and i have to ask you jimmy carr and the joke he's made now some theaters are being urged to boycott his show would you support such a boycott well, I think that is up to uh, individual theatres to make their own choices. It's not for me as a minister to tell them what to do. Uh, it's a free country. People can make their own choices. Look, I do think the joke was... Um, de I haven't actually heard it, but from what I've, what I've heard described, uh, it sounds like it was um, deeply... Uh, offensive, but it's up to individual theatres to make their own their own choice. They've got to exercise their own judgment and their own conscience. Is he funny, Jimmy Carr? Is he funny? Well, from what I've seen of him in the past, he certainly has been funny um, at times. Um, this, from what I've heard reported about this joke, this was uh, or so-called joke. Uh, it doesn't sound like it was funny. It sounds like it was gratuitously and grossly um, offensive. It all comes down to the use of words, doesn't it? And uh, the Prime Minister is under attack from some Conservatives as well as a number of Labour politicians uh, to apologise for linking Sir Keir Starmer with Jimmy Savile, which in part led to Mr. To Sir Keir being harassed and heckled outside Parliament. Uh, does the Prime Minister need to apologise? Well, no, I, I don't think so, because the Prime Minister... Well, a couple of points. Firstly, um, the Prime Minister last week uh, clarified his remarks to make clear that what he said in Parliament... Uh, was referring not to not, not was not suggesting Keir Starmer was personally and individually responsible for the uh, Jimmy Savile prosecution decisions, but that Keir Starmer, as director of public prosecutions, had overall responsibility for the CPS. Uh, something that Keir Starmer acknowledged on his own web, uh, chamber's website, and indeed he subsequently, I think, in two thousand and thirteen, apologised for the CPS's general failings in relation to the Savile case. So he clarified his remarks to make sure that there was no scope for any misunderstanding. On the, on the point about whether uh, Boris Johnson's remarks sort of caused or prompted the totally unacceptable harassment and intimidation of Keir Starmer last night, um, I don't think you can make that link for a couple of reasons. Firstly, some of the people involved in that harassment and intimidation, which was totally unacceptable, it has no place in a democracy. Some of those people uh, have been doing that over a period of time to other public figures, I think including Michael Gove and BBC journalist uh, Nick Watt. And I've, I've watched the whole clip of the harassment and intimidation that happened, and they were mostly talking, for some reason that I don't understand, they were mostly talking about Julian Assange, they were talking about COVID, they were talking about the general conduct of the opposition. They did mention Jimmy Savile as well, 
but mostly it was about Julian Assange. So I okay. don't think you can make a case that Boris Johnson's remarks uh, prompted or caused what we saw last night. But I, I think I w- want to make the point again, what we saw was completely Indeed. unacceptable. And if anyone is listening who was involved in that, or, or was thinking of getting involved in that kind of thing, I mean, just would, don't do it. Please no, indeed, desist. Indeed. It's undermining our democracy. It's completely indeed. wrong. Would you have made those sort of comments to secure? Um, look, I think that's a matter of uh, individual um, and that's why choice I asked you. Would you have people. made those um, comments? Look, I mean... Uh, I, I wasn't. I think until you stand in someone else's shoes, you shouldn't um, sort of speculate about what you may or may not. But you must say know whether you would have made the difficult and stressful such as that. Um, sure. situation. Well, I, I'm not sure I would have made them in that context. But I think the, the comments were uh, drawing attention to someone's general track record in public office is a right. kind of reasonable thing to do. And people, I mean, people comment on, Bor- on Boris's or other politicians, other leaders' uh, track record in office the whole time, often in far more graphic and critical terms than the Prime Minister used uh, in relation to Keir Starmer's tenure as um, right. as DPP. I've only got you for another minute or so, so last couple of questions. LBC has just broken the story that Liz Truss on the 29th of January held a dinner party, a birthday party for your colleague Dr Therese Coffey, sadly then contracted Covid and was unable to go to the Ukraine. Um, mm. Is it just party culture in the government? Is that all that goes on? This party was achieving. Is it just life one long party? Well, I'll tell you what, from where I'm sitting, it certainly isn't. Um, I and the, my ministerial colleagues in DCMS and the officials that we work with um, work uh, extremely long hours. I was in Parliament last night working until uh, till late. I was up early this morning. Uh, so, no, I don't think there's a party culture. Were you at that chief party? And I, and I, and I, God, no, no I've, I haven't been invited to any of these parties. I tell you what, I haven't been to a party <laughs> with, with with parliamentary colleagues for goodness knows how many years. Making me um, feel guilty, so I'm, Mr. Phil. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not on any of these invite lists. Uh, I must. <laughs> I must have upset someone. <laughs> okay. um, so, so but, but, but I don't think we should begrudge uh, Therese Coffey and uh, and Liz Truss a birthday. Uh, dinner, to be honest. I'm sure we've all been to birthday dinners um, since the lockdown restrictions have thankfully been right. eased, owing to, I think, the very um, good handling of the COVID crisis by by the Prime Minister and by the government. And lastly, um, you, you've mentioned your colleagues in DCMS. Roughly, what's the percentage of staff that's back behind their desks, Minister, just broadly speaking? I'm afraid. Are you asking me that last time? Uh, I, I I don't know. Um, I certainly when I work through the, the um, I work through I walk through the press bit, uh, the press section on the way to my office. That's the yeah. only bit of the department I walk through between the door and my office. And when I walked through it yesterday, um, it looked like uh, a majority of the press team, at least, were in. That may not be representative. In fact, it probably isn't representative of the wider department. Um, I've asked as a minister uh, to do meetings as much as possible in person because I think it's. I think you get more out of Indeed. a meeting when you're talking to someone face to face. So that's what I've asked. And personally, I'm in the department and I'm doing meetings uh, face to face in person. Right, but you, you still don't know how percentage that are back. I don't know. No, I can't get. No, I can't give you a percentage. I'm afraid. No. Do you not think it's, if the government's urging us all to go back, it's not unfair for me to ask a key government department, is it? How many are back in that? The DCMS. It's not unfair, and now you've asked it, and I'll, I'll ask the question when I'm back in the department later today. I look forward, and I'm sorry I just missed my, my birthday, otherwise I'd invite you along. Clearly there's something that you... It's been a while since you've <laughs> had an year. invite. You need to let your hair down, Mr <laughs> Phillips. I'm grateful for your time. Conservative MP, Technology and Digital Economy, Mr Chris Phillips, appearing here on LBC, where the time is two minutes after eight. Let's get the news. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC.